It's good to see you all today. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I uh, hope you get to celebrate that uh, today. Uh, on, on Mother's Day, I, I mentioned that it was probably the first time the book of Amos had been preached on Mother's Day. And dads, I did not want you to feel left out. Uh, so so we're going to open our Bibles uh, to the book of Amos. Uh, if you want to grab the Bible that's in the pew rack right in front of you, you'll find it on page 768. That's where you will find Amos chapter 6. Uh, we're going through all of Amos chapter 6 today, verses 1 uh, through 14. And, and so what we're going to do is we're just going to put a pause button on Father's Day for about 35 minutes uh, and, and focus on Amos 6, and then we can celebrate fathers for the rest of the day, if that's what you want to do. Uh, we, we know that these, that these days, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, are an opportunity for the church to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. So for some, this is a great day. You're celebrating being a father or you're celebrating your father. For others, it's difficult. You miss your dad. You wish you had a better relationship with your, whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, and I, I hope that as a church family, uh, we can do both. We can, we can rejoice with those who rejoice, honor those that deserve honor, but then also be sensitive to those that are struggling today as well. Um, and, and, and before we put the pause button on Father's Day, I, I, I wanted to say this first. Dads, you are so needed. You are so needed. You are not replaceable or, ir, or interchangeable. Uh, God has given you a special role to play in the life of your children and I believe our world and our communities are desperate for men to be the fathers God's word calls us to be. God was gracious in giving me a great dad, a great dad, uh, who, who loves Jesus and loved our family. He led us and he served us. Every morning I could find my dad in the living room of our house with his Bible open or on his knees in prayer. And now as a dad myself, uh, I'm finding it to be quite the humbling experience, and, and maybe some of you can relate to that. There, there probably it feels like there are days that there are more losses than wins uh, most days, uh, but I'm thankful that my kids don't need me to be perfect. They need me to point them to the one who is. Dads, our, our, our kids don't need us to be perfect, but they need us to point them to the one who is. They need us to point them to Jesus. And, and so today, uh, we want to say thank you to the dads who are sacrificially loving and serving and leading and protecting and providing for and praying for your families. We need you. And, and we also need God's word if we're going to be who we are called to be. And if you're a guest with us, uh, we want you to know that we believe that the Bible is what matters. Uh, we believe that what we are opening right now is the inerrant, inspired word of God himself. We believe that God has revealed himself to us through his word so we can know him and love him and worship him. In fact, we believe so much in the sufficiency of scripture that we honestly don't think that what I have to say today matters unless it agrees with what God's Word says, we want to collectively be a church that believes it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Bible says. And so we're just going to put the pause button on Father's Day and we're going to focus in on Amos chapter 6 because God has not left us in the dark to try to feel around and find an obscure clue about who he might be. No, God has spoken and he has said, this is who I am. This is what I care about. God's word is the revealing of himself to us because God wants us to know what he values. He wants us to know what behavior he condemns. And, and a week ago, I, I was having a conversation with a parent at the soccer fields before one of my son's games. And, and this parent asked me a great question about Christianity. He and as a pastor, getting questioned about Christianity at a soccer game might just be my best day ever, other, other than Father's Day, right, of course. But he asked, is, is Christianity about getting yourself together so you can do good now, or is Christianity about being ready for heaven? That's a great question. 
Uh, maybe you're thinking right now about how you would answer that question. Here, here was my response. The Bible teaches us that Jesus came to change our lives both now and forever. And, and the reason Jesus had to come was because we couldn't get ourselves together on our own. Now, you can be a, a quote-unquote good person depending on what your standard of goodness is. So I explained to him that a lot of people think they are good and have themselves put together because the standard that we are comparing ourselves to is other people, right? That's what we do. I, I'm better than that person. I'm better than this whole group of people over here. The problem is, and it's a big one, God doesn't compare us to other people. He compares us to himself. And none of us are able to meet that standard for righteousness. We all miss that mark. That's why we need someone who could represent us, who was righteous, and that someone is Jesus. Uh, that, that parent didn't realize it, but so much of what I was talking with him about that day relates to the message that we are seeing in Amos. Which, and maybe that happens to you too when you're going through a book of the Bible and you've just been in it for a few weeks. You're like, everything starts to relate to Amy. You're like, you see it everywhere. And, and I'm loving that. And, and, what, and, so much, and why I think that conversation relates to it is, is because God has revealed himself. And, and he, he gave us his word. And he gave his law to his people so they could have themselves together so they could live in right relationship with him. And if Israel had submitted to the revealed will of God, they could have been a light to the other nations of what righteousness looks like and what justice looks like. But instead, God's people were living like they didn't want to be his people. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. And when there is no standard of right and wrong, Injustice is always perpetuated. When God's word is ignored, it doesn't make things better. It makes them worse. And we saw from Amos chapter 5 that if we are going to make an eternal difference in our communities that are so hurting and broken, then we must reject the lie that we can pursue justice for the poor and the powerless while running from the righteous standard that God has caused us to, called us to live by. And we must reject the lie that we can pursue the righteousness that God has called us to live by while ignoring injustices towards the poor and the powerless. The flow of true justice and righteousness has the same source. And it's the Lord who is still in charge. And so while injustice and unrighteousness might appear to win the day now, it won't win forever. It won't. And so as we look to God's word, this is not just how he has spoken in the past, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is living and active. And so as we've been looking at God's word through his prophet Amos, our desire for this series is that we would be listening as God is speaking. And we took a break last week uh, for Senior Sunday, where we recognized our high school graduates and, and Pastor John spoke on Philippians 2 last week. And I don't know about you, but after spending the last six or seven weeks uh, just submerging myself in the themes of Amos, I found thinking about Philippians chapter 2 rather jarring. Uh, because Philippians 2, if you weren't here last week, Philippians 2 is all about the unity that we are called to that is enabled by the selfless, humble example of King Jesus. God the Son, making himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being obedient to the point of death on a cross. That's the type of humility that we are called to, one that submits to the will of God the Father and bows the knee to Jesus, the, his lordship and his rule. And the people that Amos was called to prophesy against were living as opposite of Philippians 2 as possible, right? As opposite as 
possible. They were living for their own luxury. The rich were prospering at the expense of the poor and the powerless. They were ignoring God's law. They were bowing down to idols of their own making, and they were loving it. They thought they had it all going on. They, they thought they were successful and prosperous. They were loving it. And, and, and Philippians 2 shows us the humility that God elevates. The book of Amos shows us the pride that God destroys. And chapter 6 is going to continue to expand on the guilt of Israel as well as God's judgment for their refusal to listen and, and repent. So let's jump in together. Here we go. Amos chapter 6, starting verse 1. The first word gives you a clue as the theme that we're going to be looking at today. Woe, that's great sorrow. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. The notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kelna and see. And from there go to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. So as we see the guilt of Israel here, the, the, first, the, first, uh, the first character quality that we see they're guilty of is of being complacent. Complacency. Uh, an announcement of woe is an announcement of great sorrow. So Amos is declaring that great sorrow is coming to those who feel at ease and those who feel secure. This is talking about the ruling class of Israel. People sought after their wisdom and their decisions. What these people said goes. The, the whole house, house of Israel comes to them as they issue their decrees from on high on the mountain of Samaria. So Amos is calling out those in positions of power and influence who felt pretty good about themselves and felt pretty secure in their prominence, uh, the, these rulers of the great nation of Israel. And Amos tells them, go, go look at Kelna and Hamath. And, and the reason for that is probably not immediately obvious to us, if, unless you're some historian. But, but these were cities that had already been conquered by Assyria. And God is saying, you think you're better than them? You think you're better than them? You, you think what happened to them won't happen to you? Gath was a Philistine city that was under the control of Judah. You, you really think you're so much stronger than these cities that have been conquered? And in Israel's eyes, they, these ruling people probably thought, yeah, actually, we do think we're better than them. <laughs> That's the whole point. They thought a lot of themselves. They thought they were pretty great, right? And so in their eyes, in their eyes, they probably thought they were better than these other nations that have been conquered. But God sees nations very differently than how they see themselves. And Israel's complacency is summed up well in verse 3. They put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. In other words, they were ignoring future judgment while adding to future judgment. They, will, they were ignoring future judgment. That will never happen to us while adding to it. And, and here's a good principle. When you tend to ignore consequences, you tend to add to your consequences. When you ignore consequences, you tend to add to your consequences. I, I, I should get an amen from every parent out there for that point, I think, because when my kids ignore the consequences of disobedience, they tend to disobey more. Have you noticed that? They tend to disobey more in those moments. Anyone ever make the mistake of thinking that your parent wouldn't follow through on what they threaten to do if you break one of the rules and you were really wrong in that assessment and to your surprise, they actually did follow through on what they said they would do. Uh, th this applies to more than just kids, though. If, if you ignore how you're eating, you tend to eat less healthy, not better. If you ignore debt, 
you tend to add to your debt. You don't tend to get out of it. If you ignore sin in your life, it gets worse, not better. So Israel didn't care about following God's law, and they didn't care to think about the consequences for breaking it, but the consequences were getting worse, and great sorrow was coming. Verse 4, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of a harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The ruling class was not only complacent, they were self-indulgent. Uh, quite simply, verses 4 through 6 are a picture of a sloppy drunk. Someone sprawled out on a fancy couch with their legs hanging off the edge in a drunken stupor. And it's been quite the party to get to that point. If you keep reading, a feast with lamb and steak in a culture where meat was not part of their regular diet, singing frivolous songs and joking that they were a great musician like King David, drinking wine straight from the bowl because a cup wasn't big enough, right? Just lifestyles of the rich and the famous, party all night, sleep all day, and then do it again. That's the picture. Meanwhile, they are totally desensitized to and ignoring the reality that the condition of Israel was so far from what God had called them to be as his people. In the eyes of a righteous God, his people were ruined. It's like the message of Amos here is, how can you party at a time like this? How, how can you sleep the day away in a time like this? Wake up. If you saw yourselves and your nation through the eyes of God, whose perspective is the only one that ultimately matters, you wouldn't be partying. You would be grieving over your own ruin. We, we say that Israel was conquered in 722 B.C., but it was ruined long before that. And here's a principle we should never allow the pleasures of this world to provide comfort for our spiritual condition. We should never allow the pleasures of this world to provide comfort for our spiritual condition. How quickly do we get desensitized? How quickly do we get distracted by temporary pleasures? And how often do we see others enjoying temporary ple more temporary pleasures than us and think, man, some people have all the luck. Right? We, we see people partying and enjoying the world, and we kind of are jealous. And it's pretty interesting how God views the lifestyles of prominent people that we might otherwise be inclined to be jealous of. And so as a result of the prominent and the powerful's complacency and their self-indulgence, verse 7 says, they will be the first to go into exile. You think you lead the way for this nation? Well, you are going to lead the way into captivity. And the second half of this chapter is going to expand on the judgment that is coming. And in so doing, it's going to teach us more about God the judge, like it does in verse 8. Look at this. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I, I, I love this. Because as we're going to see the judge, oh, here we go. I abhorred the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds, and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. As we see the judgment of God here, I, I first want you to see the value of God's name. Because the first phrase in verse 8 teaches us so much about our God if we're going to slow down and notice it. The Lord God has sworn by himself. See, when, when someone wants to add more weight behind their words, they might promise uh, self-inflicted punishment if they are lying. Uh, maybe you as a kid said, cross my heart, hope to die, 
stick a needle in my eye. Hmm, never saw any of my friends make good on that promise, but that's okay. Probably for the best, probably for the best. Uh, or, or, or if someone wants to put more weight behind their words, they might swear by something valuable, right? I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear to God. None of these phrases are particularly wise, by the way. The Bible tells us to let our yes be yes and our no be no. But the implication of verse 8 is that God has nothing more valuable to swear by or to swear to than himself. So you might say, I swear to God. God says, I swear to me. I swear to myself. There is no greater name for him to put more weight behind his words to. He is the Lord, the God of hosts. The, and, and God, who is rightfully on the throne, hates it when others try to prop themselves up and make themselves out to be greater than they are. I abhor the pride of Jacob and his strongholds. God hates the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amos 6 is the real life picture of pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And the fall of Israel from their prideful, presumptuously propped up position is going to be dramatic. Look at verse 9. And if 10 men remain in one house, they shall die. And when one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of the house and shall say to him who is in the innermost parts of the house, is there anyone still with you? He shall say no. And he shall say silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord. The picture is that of 10 people who have hidden away in a house from the enemy that is outside. But because they are essentially under seas in the house, they die anyway. And long after, when one of the few Israelites left comes and finds their bones, the judgment of God is going to be so severe that they don't even want to call on the name of the Lord for fear that they would draw his attention to them and they would be next. Oh, we didn't get verse 11 in there. <laughs> this is a good, this is a good, uh, oh, do I keep going? There it is. Okay. Here's a, here's a quick, uh, here's a quick uh, insight into how Pastor John and I put things together. When I send Pastor John my PowerPoint on Saturday night, I put it in like this. It says words. And then Pastor John takes it and makes it this, the words of verse 11. So we got it. And now you have an insight as to how Pastor John and I function behind the scenes. Amos 6.11. For behold, the Lord commands, and the great house shall be struck down into fragments, and the little house into bits. Not only is there no greater name, there is no greater word. Verse, tell, verse 11 tells us to look at this. Behold, look at this. The power of the word of the Lord. At his command, he just says the word. Great houses, those that feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, great houses become fragments. Those who were certain in their security aren't so secure. The little houses become bits. Why? Why would, why would the God who spoke to create the entire world speak? to bring such destruction to his people. Verse 12, do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. It would be absurd to try to have a horse run on rocks. Oxen would get hurt if you forced them to try to plow over boulders. This would be trying to go against the law of nature. He's presenting questions that are totally crazy, right? Some would say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but these are intentionally stupid questions. It's an obvious answer. No, we wouldn't do this. But just as absurd is what Israel was doing 
by turning justice into poison and righteousness into bitterness, calling injustice justice and unrighteousness righteous is absurd. It should bother us when we see this happening around us. Calling evil good and good evil is a dangerous place to be. It's contrary to nature. And, and, and God continues to mock Israel in verse 13. You who rejoice in Lodabar, who say, Have we not by our own strength captured Carnaim for ourselves? Uh, here, here's their pride again. They're saying, look how strong we are. Look how strong we are. Look at our national power. We did this by ourselves. We, we've captured all these, all these places. They, they've fallen so far from relying on the God who saves and delivers as revealed in the book of Exodus. And, and our English translation sort of misses how much God was mocking them here because that first city, Lodabar, means not a thing. So you think you're special because you've won some battles. You are rejoicing in nothing. That's the translation. And because pride goes before destruction, verse 14 shouldn't be surprising. For behold, look at this. I will raise up against you. I'm going to do this. God's going to do I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. And they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Arabah. Uh, Libo Hamath was the northernmost point of Israel, and the brook of Arabah was the southern border. So the point is that the judgment is going to be total. All of Israel is going to be judged. No part of Israel will be spared. And I think it's important for us to remember right here that God was delivering this message 40 years before Assyria would come. In other words, with all that is promised here, there was still time. There was, there was time to listen. There was time to heed these warnings, to humble themselves, to, to wake up and to grieve over their sin. Uh, you remember Jonah when he came to Nineveh. He said, you have 40 days. You have 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. God was giving his people 40 years. 40 years. Because God is gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love and mercy. But if you want to know how God, how a holy God feels about complacency and self-indulgence and temporary pleasures and pride and injustice and unrighteousness, he's pretty clear about how he feels about these things. He is not indifferent. And I think our conclusions about how God views the actions of people or nations are far too influenced by what we can see in the present circumstance rather than what we see in the eternal word. In, in other words, we, we think that because we're not seeing God act right now, he must not care, right? Because he's not judging this group of people right now, he must be indifferent. But no, 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 no. Just because we can't see it in the, our, in the present circumstance doesn't mean it's not in the word. And doesn't mean it's not going to happen. How he views Israel and nations like them is very clear. And justice might not be seen today, but it is coming. This chapter is revealing the character of a kingdom God will destroy. Which should cause us to ask, well, wait a minute. Okay, if this is what God destroys, what is the character of a kingdom God blesses? Right? If, if this is what God hates and destroys, what, what does God bless? And we have not been left to wonder the answer to that question. Because over 750 years after Amos' prophecy, God revealed himself in the midst of our brokenness, in the person of Jesus. And Jesus preached a message about the kingdom he is building and the character of its citizens. And this is what he said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. Look at this on the screen. Blessed are, not woe to, blessed are, truly happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So if you're thinking, okay, 
If true happiness and lasting pleasure isn't found in luxury and prominence and power and parties and drinking and singing and dancing and big meals and big houses, if the lifestyles of the rich and the famous aren't what I should be pursuing, if if those are the people God says, woe to, great sorrow to, then where is happiness found? Where is pleasure found? The answer might surprise you because Jesus said the pleasure of the heavenly kingdom awaits those who recognize their spiritual poverty, the poor in spirit. Eternal comfort awaits those who mourn over their sinful condition. Blessed are, truly happy are the poor in spirit who mourn because happiness is not found when we get ourselves together, but when we come to the end of ourselves, when we are grieved over our own ruin and the ruin of our world, that is when we find the comfort that the insurmountable debt we owe for our rebellion has already been paid in full by Jesus. This is why, this is why Jesus left his throne in heaven to come on a rescue mission to this earth. He didn't come for those who thought they were righteous, but for those who were, knew they were sinners and needed repentance. He did not come for the self-sufficient or those who think they are something based on their own accomplishments and resume. No, he came for the broken, and he came for the desperate. And though he was tempted like we are, Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I failed to live. He demonstrated the righteousness of the law that we never could. And then he died the death that you and I deserve to die. He took the punishment for the sin we committed against him on himself at the cross. He humbly paid the price for my pride. The righteous one suffered for my unrighteousness. And then Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered sin and the grave. So if you come to the end of yourself, if you realize that you aren't good enough on your own, you don't have it all together, if you today recognize your spiritual poverty and you are mourning over your spiritual condition, there is comfort for you at the foot of the cross and outside the empty tomb. Because if you place your faith in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. If you humble yourself today and say, Jesus, Jesus, I need you. I need you. The righteousness of Jesus is credited to your formerly guilty account. You become part of the eternal family and kingdom of God. Because even though right now it might seem like the prideful and the self-indulgent people in positions of power win, that is not, that is not the character of the kingdom God is building. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who feel secure on the mountain in their lofty mansions. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory, who sing and drink and feast, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn over their sinful condition for they shall be comforted. Do you see the contrast? Do you see it? Do you see what God's going to bring down and what God is building up? This should be a challenge and an encouragement to all of us, but especially to us dads. God is not calling us to waltz around like kings of our own castles. He is not calling us to complacency and the comfort that is found in worldly pleasures. He's calling us to humility. He's calling us to grieve over our sin, to grieve over our pride, to to hunger and to thirst for his righteousness. So let's lead our families in showing them which kingdom matters. Let's lead our families in showing them it's not about the kingdom we can build ourselves, but it's about the one God is building. Let's lead our families in demonstrating the character he desires. Let's lead our families in showing them that the comfort our souls need isn't found 
in worldly things. It's found in a restored relationship with the God of the universe. Lasting comfort isn't found in our kingdom, but in God's kingdom. Do we believe that, church? Do we believe that? Lasting comfort isn't found here. It's not here. It's found in God's kingdom and in a restored relationship with our king. See, see the message of the world is you deserve this right now, right? Just immediate gratification. That's what you're promised over and over and over again. Immediate gratification. You don't have to wait. You deserve this now. And that pull, the pull of comfort and the draw towards complacency is constantly tugging at us. Ease and security and pleasure are easy sells. But the gospel calls us to trade in temporary complacency for eternal comfort that is found in Jesus. And I believe that trade is worth it every single time. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we want to humble ourselves before you today. And I pray that you would open our eyes to your word. And you would open our eyes to the types of kingdoms that you are going to bring down. And the type of kingdom that you are building. And I pray that we would grieve over our sinful condition that we would depend on Jesus, that, that we would live for you and live for your word and live for the kingdom that you are making, the one that you are in charge of. Jesus, we want to acknowledge that we are so unworthy, but you are worthy. You alone are worthy. I pray that our lives would echo the words of that song that we are going to sing right now. Thank you that in our brokenness, you came to save us. And I pray that we would recognize your kingship and your lordship over us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.